Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Today, we have a special guest, Jackie Boyle, PharmD, MBA, MS, and she's got some other letters after there, including BCPS. She's a pharmacist who seeks innovation, interprofessionalism, and teaching opportunities. She believes it's essential to contribute back to her profession and enjoys being highly engaged in pharmacy organizational work. Uh, she is an assistant professor at Northeast Ohio Medical University. And welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Thanks, Tony. Thank you so much for having me. This is an honor. Okay. Well, uh, we both just came back from ASHP and I came back to Iowa and you went back to Ohio. So we, we have a lot of vowels in our na- in our uh, state's names and we have a lot of cold uh, <laughs> outside. So I appreciate you uh, being on here with me. Um, the first thing I kind of wanted to ask is to just let everybody know a little bit about you. So uh, everyone's leadership road is a little bit different. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you got to the position that you're in? Yeah, absolutely. So I honestly, before pharmacy school, I wasn't really involved in professional organizations. I think in undergrad, I I missed that boat. Um, I played a sport um, when I was in undergrad, so that took up a lot of time. I actually played rugby, little known fact. Uh, That's my my icebreaker fact that I always (laughs) use. But I started seeing in pharmacy school that my faculty and my mentors were really involved in professional organizations. And so that's where we started. I was lucky enough to be in one of the early classes at Northeast Ohio Medical University or Neomed. Um, We were the second class. So there was a huge opportunity to not only be involved in pharmacy organizations, but also to start some new ones because we just didn't have them at that time. So that's where I started in the the organization side, was realizing how important it was to give back to the profession and just how valuable organization work was to the future of my career. Yeah, I'd interviewed Dallas Tolbert from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and she was one of the uh, first over there in a in a relatively new school. And uh, she talked about all the opportunities that she had because it was a smaller class, because uh, they were pioneering and, and going through like that. So, and then uh, you guys have a, a lot of room to brag about NAPLEX scores, uh, Neomed as well. So I think that that's uh, really amazing that you're you guys have come together so well. What's it like to be in a smaller class? Because we have, uh, you know, mm-hmm. usually we see classes mm-hmm. of 100, 120. Uh, are you closer to 50 or 60? Or what was it like? Yeah, we were about 60, 70 at the end of the day. Um, I came from the Ohio State University prior to Neomud, so it was That's a huge, a huge culture <laughs> shift. Um, but honestly, one that I needed because um, being in a more, a smaller setting, a more focused um, university was what I needed for my professional side. But then also, I realized that that small uh, kind of family, t- you know, close knit setting was great because I really got to know my faculty and some of them have remained mentors into my professional career. Yeah, that's what I keep hearing is that uh, the smaller s- schools tend to be a welcome to the family. And it, mm-hmm. it works almost like a, a liberal arts campus. Uh, at Maryland, where I was, the graduate school is separate from the main mothership is, you know, you went to Ohio State, I went to the University of Maryland, Maryland College mm-hmm. Park for a year where we have about 35,000 students, and then the small graduate college is just 5,000, and then our class was a little under 100. So uh, that intimate family feel really does help you uh, get through pharmacy school. Well, tell me a little bit about what brought you to the ASHP meeting. Oh, I love ASHP. So I got involved with this organization when I was a student um, during my first year of pharmacy school, but really more so in my second year is when I started attending state meetings. Uh, So we have the Ohio Society, um, and that organization has been my passion, and I'm the president of OSHP now. But ASHP, um, I had the opportunity to go there when I was a pharmacy resident on a rotation with their government relations group, and I it was professionally 
life-changing. I was able to actually go to Capitol Hill um, and advocate for pharmacist provider status. And I, I loved working with the non-pharmacist because they have such a great perspective of not only pharmacy, but how that we need to best position ourselves to make some real change in our country. So that was my first big involvement with ASHP. I've been involved with committee work um, and leadership on the member side, but I've gotten the opportunity to to go to ASHP for a few big initiatives, um, the advocacy one being the first and then the second being um, the Women in Leadership Steering Committee. So this has, these two opportunities have really shaped a lot of things that I'm doing now um, in my professional organization life. Um, I just had the opportunity, I want to say it was maybe even a month ago now, uh, Kate Gaynor, Anthony Pudlow over at the Iowa uh, Pharmacy Association um, had two of our state senator, a state senator and a state representative come in and uh, we got to meet them, listen to them, talk to them uh, one on one. And I don't really think I understood the importance of a PAC and how involvement and giving really matter to mm -hmm. um, someone that is running for office. And the big shocker for me was when I actually looked up the salaries of these uh, state representatives and senators, and I want to say it's about $20,000. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that a lot of misconception comes that there's a, there's a mistaking between the senators that represent us as a nation and then those state senators and uh, where their income comes from and how they can advocate and to run a campaign to to be part of the system to be there for us as pharmacists we really need to support them both uh, as you know being there and financially can you tell me a little bit about how, how you in ohio explain what a PAC is and what the importance is of uh political action committee i think it gets bad uh, bad representation uh, when we talk about them on the Hill, uh, but locally uh, in Ohio, uh, what's so important about the PAC? Yeah, and, you know, actually within OSHP, we don't have a PAC uh, yet. You know, that's something that we're definitely discussing, um, but I've consistently donated to the PAC at the ASHP level because it, how we talk about it in Ohio is that this is really, this is like insurance for your profession. So you you, you can't underestimate the value of building relationships with your legislators and what those funds do really is allow us to have opportunities to be at the table. So if we are able to support campaigns, if we are able to you know, fund some things that the legislators are doing that are very important to them and we can be at those at the table to have those conversations, that's where the relationships are built and that's how we can really have an impact. These these things don't happen overnight. I mean, it's like any relationship that you have, right? It's not, oh, I, I meet you once and I'm going to do this huge favor for you right away. Um, I, I have to develop, <laughs> I have to develop yeah. trust. I have to develop an understanding of where you're coming from, what, what is important to the profession of pharmacy and why I should support you in those endeavors. So by having a, a means of funding to be at the table, um, that's where that money really is that professional, you know, insurance that we can make some real change. No, I, I definitely understand. And, and, Change is certainly going to be evident regardless of what we do. It's just a matter of uh, how much can we guide uh, what's happening and how much can we tell them, you know, what it is that we need. Um, so yes. let's let's take it back to the ASHP meeting a little bit uh, and talk about networking, because I think this is maybe a little bit of a vague term for students mm -hmm. and even mm -hmm. residents. Um, what does it mean to network to you? Can you take me through your networking I don't want to say process because mm -hmm. you don't necessarily, you know, outline it that way, but, but what's your, how do you network? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because doc, uh, I, I call him Dr. Albrick sometimes still Tim Albrick and I, we work together now. Um, he was previous, previously my professor, but we, um, co-direct a course at Neomed that helps students get ready for residency. And we always talk about this nebulous, quote unquote, networking, right? Like it's just supposed to happen. It's so easy. Um, and students just kind of have a blank stare sometimes of where do I even begin? So I, I try to advise my students that 
If you've been to the residency showcase, which I know, Tony, you have been there. Some students, <laughs> some students yeah. have gone as well. Um, that's not the place that you're necessarily going to make the best connection. It, it's definitely an information gathering venue. Um, you know, there are thousands and thousands of students and preceptors and RPDs that are there. Uh, but it, it essentially is, is like a huge trade show where it, it, it's hard for you to fight for a few words here and there. And if, if they remember you, it's probably something bad. So I try to, <laughs> I try to avoid, I hear that I again to, and again. <laughs> yeah, so I try to advise my students set up some time outside of the showcase where you can have a meaningful conversation, whether that over coffee, whether that's over lunch. You know, you can't really develop a relationship in a two to three minute conversation where somebody might be meeting two to 300 people that day. So how do I, how do I start with networking? I think it's just connecting with the person on a mutual level. You know, you have to be good at making small talk, asking them how their day is going, what their what their plans are at mid-year, how they get involved with ASHP, find some common ground to start on. And I feel like the conversation really flows naturally from there. Yeah, I think there's one, uh, one opportunity that I saw a lot of students miss was maybe uh, focusing so much on the showcase. And I understand they, they want those residencies, uh, but not connecting with the people that are presenting their posters. And I went through uh, two of the student poster presentations, uh, and then there was the resident poster presentation. And uh, I got to see my own APPE students presenting. That was my primary reason for going. Mm -hmm. But then I also found that if you go through there, you'll find uh, certain what you're interested in, and I was most interested in what's going on with uh, well-being and, and how pharmacy students make it through in terms of, you know, financially, uh, how are they, you know, dealing with the stresses and things like that. So I went through aisle by aisle and I would, this would be what you would call networking for me is that I talked to those people that had the same interest as I did. So whether mm -hmm. you're interested in ambulatory care, cardiology, whatever it is, there were other people to network with at the poster. And that's a time where they have nothing but time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I think you bring up a good point because I feel that sometimes the students and residents might view that as an underrated opportunity um, and just another checkbox that they have to meet. So I agree. I think that the students don't realize people are coming up to your poster because they're interested in what you're presenting. Um, and they, they're going to have some questions, yes. And what it, is it a little bit intimidating? Sometimes, but but you're right. I mean, they will they will connect with you because they're interested in seeing what's new and innovative in the space that they're they're passionate about. Well, tell me a little bit about networking that you might have done. Uh, the invites that that you get. Um, I went to uh, Creighton Universities because I'm a preceptor for Creighton, Drake, and Iowa. And then I also went to the PTCB get together. And then I also went to the Maryland uh, get together. So uh, three. Uh, places to network. And this is uh, five or six to eight o'clock, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, did you go to any of those sessions after? Oh, absolutely. Those are my favorite. Um, I, am, I am ENFJ, so I'm an uh, extrovert at heart. So really, oh, okay. the, the networking <laughs> is my favorite. Um, I, I went to a couple of the, obviously went to the Neomed reception. Um, I've gone to the Toledo reception a few times because of one of my, my colleagues graduated uh, from that school. Uh, but I went to the PAC reception for ASHP um, to show support there. And then being in the president's office for Ohio, um, I was able to go to the ASHP president's dinner and also uh, the president's reception. So those are so inspirational to me. Um, it's, it's so nice to see and, and meet and have conversations with leaders in our profession because it, it really, it, it confirms what I'm doing is the right thing. Um, but also I just gain so much inspiration and, and new knowledge and advice from meeting with and connecting with these leaders at the national level. Yeah, and those were really comfortable meetings for me. I I was talking to residency director at Maryland. I was also talking to uh, PGY2 uh, RPD. Is that I, I want to make sure I get the acronym right? Yes. Res yeah. RPD for PGY2. Uh, Bethany DePaula, who uh, does the psych. 
Uh, and then at Creighton, uh, I got to hear the dean speak and then uh, the assistant dean and then met with Everett McAllister from CEO of PTCB and then APHA president Nancy Alvarez. So here we are in rooms of 30 to 40 people uh, and it's a couple hours and uh, this is really where the leaders are hanging out, talking to people and and it's completely outside the showcase. So I'm definitely saying go to the showcase, figure out what you need to from there, but that your mm -hmm. day's not done. Like the we all want to relax after showcase. We all want to, yeah. you know, take a break from that. Yes. Uh, you, you don't yeah, get bumped around a lot. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, my, my involvement with ASHP actually started at a reception. So oh. I was a resident at a reception uh, in 20, oh gosh, 13. Uh, and at the ASHP Whitney reception, myself, my pharmacy director at the time, Jason Glowcheski, who, if you've met, uh, he's a phenomenal, awesome, uh, contagious person, was with me. And he said, hey, let's go find, you know, some ASHP leaders to meet and, and connect with. And we met Casey Thompson, who um, is in the, the administration of ASHP. And my director said, hey, Casey, you know, do you ever take residents on rotations at ASHP? And he said, yeah, we do. But let's see if we can work something out that might be a little bit different and have the resident come to spend time with government relations. So Chris Topoleski, um, he, he, had, he launched me into advocacy and is the reason that I'm so passionate about it now. Um, but it, really that connection started by a short five, 10 minute conversation at one of the receptions at Midyear. It all comes together. And Pharmacy yeah. Nation is so small that it's it, it really isn't uh, that hard. But let's talk a little bit about the introvert because you have that extrovert mm -hmm. tendency. But uh, I tend to find that many of the uh, pharmacy students are introverts. Do you have any um, advice or tips for someone who might be a little more introverted that is maybe a better, a pretty good listener, but uh, wouldn't be the first to start the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have come to realize, and I actually am really jealous of the introverts because they, you know, they think before they talk, unlike me. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I am trying to learn from the introverts how to gain some of those skills. Um, and I've been reading a lot about this because I, I don't think it's uncommon to our profession, but I know that our profession is primarily made up of introverts. So first thing, you know, to do is look, you know, walk in the room, look around, most people are introverts. So just you know, remind yourself of that common ground that maybe everyone else is feeling a little uncomfortable too in starting conversations. So just have that in, in the back of your mind as a baseline of, hey, we're all here together and maybe someone else is feeling uncomfortable too. Secondly, check, you know, look for people that are maybe standing by themselves or at a table where no one is has approached them yet. And those people may be introverted, or maybe they're just waiting for someone to come up and talk to them. So it's it's not super hard to start a conversation at a place like Midyear because you're with a group of like minded individuals, right? So make that connection by just introducing yourself, where you're from, ask them how their day is go going. If you ask them, how are you? That's kind of a short, oh, I'm fine. You know, you know, today's been okay. But ask them how their day is going, because then likely you're going to get a story back of, oh, this morning, I went to this session. You know, today, I'm at this reception, and I feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> but you might find that you can connect and generate some small talk, but just by just asking the right open ended question. Yeah, and, and I really, uh, my wife is uh, introvert, I'm extrovert, and she talks about how, you know, I'll, I'll make friends with everyone in the room, but then I'll, I'll have to ask her like what everyone said, because she's such a good listener, she'll know exactly mm -hmm. uh, everything that's going on. And it's not that I don't, I, I don't know, maybe I just talk too much. But, <laughs> but I so, you. <laughs> so, you know, you know, Tim Albrick, we have that uh, connection in common. Mm -hmm. uh, he has, uh, I believe, a podcast as well. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about uh, what you're doing uh, to kind of get the word out about pharmacy, because I feel like we do a good job of talking within our profession and to ourselves, but maybe not the best uh, talking to people who are outside of the pharmacy space. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I've 
Well, Tim is, is the reason really that I've started in the entrepreneurial space. Um, but I've started a blog called The Pharmacy Girl because I, as through my ASHP involvement in women in pharmacy leadership, I realized that there's a uh, um, a need for professional and personal development for women in pharmacy. But actually through that platform, I've been able to invite in non-pharmacy individuals to give their input about professional and personal development. I think a lot of these skills and topics are not specific to pharmacy and really want to bring in that outsider's perspective so that pharmacists or student pharmacists, residents can see that these are not uncommon issues. Secondarily, I believe social media has just changed the game <laughs> for how we can communicate with individuals. So I'm, I'm active on many platforms. I don't know maybe how to use Twitter or Snapchat as much yet, but I try to get out the word about what pharmacists do and, and share you know, our initiatives on social media platforms so that people who are not pharmacists um, or the public can really gain a better understanding. So that's been my main platform for our communicating to the public and then also involve, being involved in professional organizations. We do have the opportunity to do community outreach um, and educate the public on that level as well. So tell me a little bit about um, how you see entrepreneurship going into uh, college. I don't want to talk about specific colleges as having X amount of entrepreneurship versus less, uh, you know, something like that. But rather, um, how could students uh, become more entrepreneurial? Because really at its heart, entrepreneurship is kind of doing something that's a passion project to you. Uh, mm -hmm. that is so individualized that it's almost unfair to ask a pharmacy school to teach an entire you know, block on entrepreneurship, maybe, uh, but maybe they should. Uh, but what I want to get at is how would a student now get a leadership entrepreneurial uh, uh, start um, or how would you recommend it? Yeah, that is, that's a great question too. So I agree. I think that it would be hard to you know, try to identify and, and maybe foster every individual's passion. But I believe doing a lot of self-reflection can really help you identify where, where is it that you, what, what do you get excited about? You know, what do you spend your free time on? What need have you identified or what gap in either the professional world or in your own personal development do you see as, as a, a place that you can help solve a problem. I mean, really, that's what entrepreneurship is about. You, you identify a need and you fill in a solution. Um, something I think, you know, schools can be doing because really innovation and entrepreneurship are some of the new standards that are coming into pharmacy education is provide a framework for developing new services or new business ideas, um, healthcare costs are rising. So if we want to continue expanding pharmacy practice and what we can do as pharmacists, you really, I believe, need a little bit of business savvy to be able to push that envelope forward. Um, you have to have that innovative uh, thought process, but also be somewhat creative as to how you insert pharmacy into the picture because those funds are not necessarily getting bigger. We just need to work with what money that we do have more efficiently and effectively. So some of the basic skills of developing new services, I believe, is a place that colleges of pharmacy can start to help these students. Another thing, uh, I just network. I mean, if you meet, I, I could tell you I spent some time at ASHP Midyear with Eric Christensen, um, who runs the MedEd 101 website and blog. And he, we spent an hour or two talking about just website development. And I can tell you, I, I would, it would have taken me days <laughs> to learn the things, <laughs> Okay, probably weeks to even learn the things that he, he showed me and talked to me about and advised me on. So if you're interested in a certain space of pharmacy, likely someone is already out there doing it, or they can help advise you and guide you in the right direction. Yeah. And you talked about social media being a game changer. We're tremendously available. Like I, I, right. I, I answer my emails. I answer, well, people actually usually reach me by Facebook messenger or mm -hmm. Twitter uh, direct messaging or something like that. And, and I'm happy to help them. And then we, you know, a lot of times we'll do podcast episodes around uh, things that 
are maybe really uh, helpful for these students or, or they can get them along. What is it to start a website, to start a blog, mm-hmm. to start a podcast? Uh, talking with uh, Hillary Blackburn at ASHP, uh, I just released that episode that she uh, started as a volunteer at the Dispensary of Hope. And then now she's the director <laughs> of pharmaceutical services, oh, a position that wasn't even there. Uh, mm-hmm. that she created. So what I'm hearing over and over is that volunteerism and just reaching out to those people who uh, want to help you, uh, we just need to know what, what it is you want us to help you with. Um, right. Well, I guess uh, we talked a little bit before uh, the show about uh, women in leadership, and I have three six-year-old girls, so I'm all about girl power. <laughs> and I guess it's tough for me to understand what the disconnect is and why that that gap would happen if our profession is now, I want to say it's about two thirds women uh, in the pharmacy schools. Uh, mm-hmm. um, where is a disconnect maybe that uh, we have with women and getting them to the leadership positions? I know Aaron Albert's especially passionate about getting them into the C-suite. Yeah, you know, I think, and Tony, I don't know if you got a chance to catch Michelle Obama's keynote speech but wow, uh, it was phenomenal. Um, and and some, some of the things that she talked about was that if women are not at, in the conversation, then really whatever discussions are happening, only half of the story is being told. And this goes both ways. I wouldn't want, like Michelle said, I wouldn't want a room full of women discussing, discussing an important issue because then we're only getting half of the story. So um, I think there's a lot of professional initiatives that need to have equal representation there. Um, I believe that women may face some unique challenges um, trying to figure out how we can best integrate work and life and, and, and managing the imposter syndrome that comes along with taking on new positions or not feeling adequate um, in, in pursuing those. So, we might face those challenges more commonly, or maybe it is that we don't have the right tools per- personally or professionally to be able to um, overcome those. So, you know, something that we talked about in women in, in steering, the women in leadership steering committee was that uh, men are really good at sponsoring each other. And, and what that means is that the, you know, these behind the scenes conversations of promoting and getting into higher level positions. Men are just really good at doing that. Women are, are not, you know, we, we, we are not, we have not had those, those tools in our toolbox. It's not an instinct for us to promote others. We're really good at mentoring. Um, but we really need some help in that sponsoring area. So, I feel like that might be one of the reasons that women might not make it um, to the higher levels of administration in the healthcare profession. Um, another thing is that you know sometimes women are our own worst enemies. We can see that there are only so many women leaders at the, the top echelons, and so it becomes almost a little bit of a competition to get there. And unfortunately, that is how it is viewed at some point. So I believe it's multifactorial. I believe it's not necessarily... A, a male versus female um, situation. It's just that there are our gender differences in how we communicate and maybe how we've um, progressed through the professional rankings that are that's holding women back at, at some points. Yeah, I, I didn't even. I guess that's kind of a news to me. I didn't. I do it so naturally to to sponsor and and promote my uh, the other friends, and I, I don't really necessarily worry about gender. But it's just something that's natural to me to to promote them. If somebody asks me about them, I'm happy to do it. Uh, so um, that's great to understand that that uh, maybe gap is there. Well, uh, I want to keep it under around thirty minutes. Is there anything else that maybe we haven't talked about that you want to make sure that people hear? Hmm. Um, you know, I think uh, I had a great conversation with Alina Seckel yesterday from um, the Madison, Wisconsin VA. She is really involved with ASHP as well. And we're, we're pretty much at the same exact point in our professional career, you know, about five years in, starting to get really involved um, with a lot of different things, um, starting new services, etc. So her and I talked a lot about how you know, it's okay not to have it all. 
Um, I think that sometimes as pharmacists, we are overachievers and we want to do everything all the time. Um, so we we had a great conversation about how, you know, sometimes people don't see the times when you're saying no or pulling back. And if you have that self-awareness to realize, okay, what am I passionate about? What do I want to get involved with? But then also realize when you're, you've reached your, your limits and you don't want to overstretch yourself because then you're not giving 100% of yourself to anything, whether that's at work, whether that's at home. Um, it, it, you can get to that point. And how do we help each other in the pharmacy community not feel overstretched or burnout? Um, and I know you mentioned the Clinician and Wellbeing Initiative, and I'm really excited about that as, as well because we can certainly get there, right? We can probably work 24-7 if, if we wanted to. but. No, but definitely. that's not healthy for us. We can't take care of others if we're not taking care of ourselves. And then just a couple, three quick hit questions here at the end. Uh, what's the best career advice you've ever given or received? Oh, I'm trying to, let's see if I can narrow it down to one. I've gotten so many. You can do more than one. It's not, it, it's <laughs> permitted. <laughs> oh, um, hmm. I, I think, you know, self-reflection and, and finding your, your mission and what you want to do in your career is, is really important. And I've had many mentors tell me that, um, and, and that's really helped focus me in deciding what it is that I, that I do want to do, is writing actually a mission and vision statement for myself. Um, and that includes work and life and how, how I want to approach life. Um, I think modeling being a leader in pharmacy, as you are, Tony, you know, modeling what it is that you want to portray to those who are following you. So, for example, if you're working, if you're working 12 hour to 16 hour days, then those who are following you are going to think that that's what they should be doing as well. Um, you know, if you're not practicing what you preach, per se, then then it sends that message whether you, you want it to or not uh, to others. And then I guess thirdly is you know, look out for your own, your, yourself and your professional and personal interests. You have to kind of define what it is that you want out of work and life because no one's going to do that for you, right? So find out what you're, you're passionate about and what you want that work-life integration, let's say, because I don't believe there's a balance really. <laughs> um, but find out what it is that you want that to look like and, and pursue it, you know, pursue it with, with fire and passion and, and, and protect yourself so that you are able to care and continue to give to others. What's a daily ritual or habit that keeps your work on track? Ooh, good one. So someone once told me, and I've got to believe it was during residency, to not check email first. So when you get in the office, get your top one, at least your top one thing done, um, if not two or three. But I, I usually have three big things I want to accomplish for the day. And I try to get at least that first one done before I open the black hole, rabbit hole of email. So um, I think that's made me a little bit more productive because I don't get endlessly distracted and interrupted with the notifications of emails that might not be necessarily urgent at the time. And then last uh, question, what inspires you? Oh, so many things. Um, I, I believe the, the biggest thing that inspires me is seeing how I can help others be successful. So whether that's my students, whether that's colleagues that I know, whether it's patients who are trying to you know take control of their health care and their, their health conditions, um, I think seeing others be successful really helps continue to drive me and, and wake me up every day to say, wow, I'm, I'm so glad that I have a job that I feel like I shouldn't be paid for. All right. Well, thanks so much for being on the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag HashPharmacyLeaders 